Hi, welcome to Ghostman Radio Station. And tonight my guest is Kevin D. Hoffman. He's an accomplished writer and public speaker who has a passion for adoption and especially transracial adoption. Joy is sharing his experience by racial transracial adoptee to help other adoptive families. His book, Growing Up Black and White, has helped many to see what life is like from the viewpoint of an adoptee appearing over the United States, speaking to parents and professionals. His perspective is light-hearted, yet com- plenty of view. is sought after by many. He's been interviewed by NPR, a nighttime ABC, has quickly becoming a trusted voice in the adoption area. He currently lives in T- 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 Toled- Toledo, Ohio, I might have got that wrong though. A bit well, rusty with names, America. Shares his time with his wife and two teenage sons. And when he, and when he, he worked, oh, he's adopted, he's part of the Adopt America Network, which is also a very good thing to do. And he also sees my guest today. Now, Kevin, obviously your story is in, inspiring, but tell me a little bit about what it was like living as a kid in your youth, knowing that you were both adoptee and the triple whammy of being black and white at the same time you you must be born the lucky star that's all i can say <laughs> yeah so it was really interesting to be you know i was this i was the result of an affair between a black man and white woman uh, who were happily married just to two different people so uh, my mother chose to give birth to me her white husband's only only request was that she put me up for adoption immediately. So she did. So I was adopted by a white minister, his wife, and I have, and they have uh, three biological children, two sons and a daughter. So I'm the youngest in that family. We grew up in Detroit, which is, especially in the time that I grew up, uh, which was in the late 60s, it was an area where we had a lot of civil unrest and it all really just boiled down to the fact that you know black people and white people just couldn't get along so it was an interesting time to grow up in this city that has been defined by race detroit to be a kid who's you know biracial black and white trying to figure out you know what my identity is how i see the world so it was an interesting time to grow up an interesting way to grow up and an interesting place to grow up. And yeah, it, it was very impactful for me. Kind of no, obviously you you know about the Black Life Matters. I think it's more prevalent over the States than it is here. We did have it for a little while. I think it's died over here a little bit more than the States, obviously. I think it's because, obviously, the perception of the police. You have a lot of police that don't accept. They see a black man and instantly think he's up to no good. That's it, gun out. You know, right. you know, it's sad to say that fact, but it's true. Now, what do you think of the Black Lives Matter? Do you think it's a good movement? And do you think it will bring about change? I think it's a, it's a great movement that has been misinterpreted. So I think a lot of people get frustrated because they assume Black Lives Matter was created to solve all issues regarding race. And it wasn't. It specifically was created to address police brutality. Um, our country has a very long and you know, storied history of you know, people of color being mistreated by the police. That's what started the riots back in 67 in Detroit. When I was born. So this isn't something new. We've been dealing with this for decades. Um, and so there is some uh, validity to the Black Lives Matter group. And it's interesting, I think, I think here's the difference. There is a group of people who, when, when it is said Black Lives Matter, and when we say it, it's meant to mean Black Lives Matter also. But when it's said, there's a group of people who will hear only Black Lives Matter. And those two words make a huge difference in how that's interpreted. And so the Black Lives Matter doesn't mean 
were more important than anybody else. It's simply asking a question that I think all people can relate to, which is, we are being hurt and brutalized. Please stop. I agree with it. I, I, do you? I don't like the fact that. Um, I don't. I don't know if you think I'm wrong. You can say I'm wrong. I don't mind. Um, that when you read certain books, there are certain. Words, I mean, I mean, there, if it's an excessive word of a lot, I won't use it. I mean, obviously, you know the words I'm on about. But there's certain words in in old books that they used to describe coloured people. It wasn't a nice word. But do you think it's right to keep the history and learn from history? Or do what most people want to do is take away the pictures or take away the way you're not allowed to say, oh, um, say over here, we've got a problem with the, the what do you call it, BLAM community, black, Asian, a mixed race. Uh, they won't, they're not taking up the vaccine so much. But I think they're too frightened to say the word. Oh, it's because they're thinking if they say, oh, please take the jab, they're frightened if, if they say the word black, they might be taken at the wrong context. I think it's become almost a swear word without meaning to be a swear word. Yeah, and it, I mean, it's... What we don't get is that everything evolves. So, yeah, they were back in the 50s and 60s, we were referred to as colored, and then that changed, we were referred to as black, and then that changed, we were referred to as African-American. So, I mean, we're just evolving and growing as a country. So that's expected that things like that are going to change over time, and they should. And so that what was accepted terminology, you know, decades ago is no longer accepted. I don't think, I don't think there's an issue with that. I, don't, I think that logically that makes sense to me, and hopefully for most people it makes sense. Oh, so let's, get, let's delve into your book now. I mean, I um, we've got... Growing up black in white, and you've got table context. We'll just go a little bit in, a little bit of it, because we don't want to give away too much, because obviously we want people to go out and buy your excellent book. Now, you've got chapter one is welcome. Yeah, and that is basically telling the story of my birth and then me being adopted and, and going to live with this new white family in a white suburb of Detroit. So we lived in Dearborn. My father was a minister, associate pastor at the church in Dearborn. And uh, the way that community welcomed us was when I was 11 months old, we woke up to a cross burning in our front yard. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Yeah. See, we forget about things like that. I mean, you know, it's... We, I think I don't like things like that. If I don't like someone, I don't like someone. It doesn't necessarily mean because they're colour or whatever. It just I don't bother talking to them. It's it's a bit more simpler than burning across and yeah, you know, hate. I don't like that. And the second chapter you got it takes a lot of extra work. Yeah, and the second chapter you got God odds or good odds. God God odds. I think he says. Yeah, so that has to do with the fact that you know I was this. Biracial kid born out of an affair, and the odds of me in place, at the odds of actually me being adopted in Detroit at a time when the literally the the city was still burning from the horrible riots we had in '67, and so the fact that this biracial kid was able to find a home when at that time the races were just at each other's throats, and so. I was considered a hard-to-place child because I was a biracial child. And so white people wanted white kids and black people wanted black kids. So, yeah, it, it was really just God I, that I was placed and given a home. Next bit is heartbroken. Yeah, and that talks about my mother's mother, my grandmother, and how she really struggled with the fact that she had a grandchild that was of color. That's how she described it when she found out that my mother was adopting a child of color. My grandmother's response to that was, well, I was heartbroken. Yeah, it's a, it, and it kind of hurts to hear your grandmother say that she was heartbroken about you being part of her family. 
Yeah, but it probably goes back to what we were talking before because he's probably been in in a brainwash with the ideas that probably weren't her own, but she's always forever, you know, re, uh, hearing them and seeing them every day. Yeah, and she was just taught, always taught that people of color were left at night. So she didn't want that in her family. And the next one is the Luther, Lutheranian Inquest. Oh, so the Lutheran Inquisition, yes, that was church that we belonged to in that suburb of Detroit where my father was the pastor, uh, they went about trying to fire him because he brought me into that community. So that talks about that. And the next one is obviously very dear to you, identity. Yeah, and that was just me as this biracial kid trying to find out and figure out who I am and how I identify. You know, in this time where, you know, just so much was about race. Strange, isn't it? Uh, the next one is promoted. Oh, so that is when I, when I was three years old, we moved from that white community into Detroit, where my father became a, a, the head pastor of a church. Where we lived was a black neighborhood. So we lived there for five years, and then my dad gets promoted to be the assistant bishop of Southeast Michigan. And so we have to move. We moved two miles away, still in Detroit, but now it's an all white neighborhood. And that's the first time I really start to feel the effects of being this you know, child of color in a predominantly white environment. The next one is unconditional acceptance. Talks about people that I grew up with, and through exposure with each other, I remember, you know, moving into that white neighborhood. It just, I mean, I just physically stuck out. I looked different than the other kids in the neighborhood, and uh, yeah, it took a long time for us as kids to figure out how we were going to get along. Cause no one really was helping. The parents just decided, just let them play; they'll figure it out. We eventually did, <laughs> but oftentimes it was at my expense. The next one is allies. And that talks about in that neighborhood is where I found uh, my best friend that I've known for over 45 years. Um, this tall, you know, white kid that lived directly across the street from me. And he became an ally, him and his family, and they protected me just as much as my old friend. It's always nice when you get that, isn't it? It's, it's, it's a, uh, they didn't, he didn't judge you for who you are. You just were, you know, to him, Kevin. That was it. Yeah, and, and they understood that race was important to me, so we didn't ignore it. You know, and that's why my friend became my best friend is because he was willing to listen to me. And, and just hear the pain that I had because I, you know, something simple as, you know, I think the woman down the street treats me differently because I'm black. And as a friend, I don't want to sit here and debate with you whether I got that right or wrong because that just causes me more pain. And as a friend, he just would simply say, yeah, man, you're probably right. And I just needed someone like that to hear what I was going through. And the next one is Undercover. to my parents about people of color because they didn't know that they were raising a black child or people would say to me, you know, things about white people, not knowing that I lived with white people. So it was just kind of this sense that and I was kind of living undercover because people didn't know that part of, a lot of people didn't know that part of my life. And the next one, uh, I hope I get this name right, Mrs. M M Matez and... Brick, Brick Lees? Yeah, that's, so Mrs. Matz is the mean woman in 
that white neighborhood that would that I felt treated me differently simply because I was black. And then Brickley's was a store in that same neighborhood. And those are two very clear incidents that had to do with race you know, that I experienced growing up you know, at an early age. And they were, yeah, they were based on race. I was treated differently simply because I looked different. Next one is tough. And the next one is just a story about growing up in that white neighborhood and actually uh, me and my best friend, we were held up um, by some young punks and, and they stole money from us. Um, and they were young black kids. So it talks about you know, just the struggle I had with that. that you know, I was being robbed by kids that looked like me. Uh, and kind of how that played with and the next one is another brother. And that was, it talks about the evolution in the white neighborhood of, you know, when I first got there at eight years old, there was a kid that lived in that neighborhood that just hated me because his father taught him that black people were bad. And he had never had any relationships with black people. So when I first met him, we didn't get along. It was you know, because his father taught him he don't like black people. Well, I lived in that neighborhood until I went away to uh, university. So I was there for 10 years. And over those 10 years, the relationship between me and this kid who hated me evolved into the point when I, when I left for college. He was like a brother. And next one is diversity training. And that what I had gone, oh, it, it's the experience of going away to, uh, to the university, um, a predominantly white university, and kind of trying to get my bearings in that environment. I, at 18, I just assumed the world was like Detroit, and that, you know, anywhere I go, I would always see people that looked like me. I didn't realize that, you know, at the university, that wasn't the case at all. So it was me trying to figure out how to how to navigate in that environment as his personal development. And the last chapter is blacklisted. And that tells the story of my father, who was a minister, who uh, eventually was blacklisted from the church because he adopted me. So when I was, I'd mentioned he got a promotion to be the assistant to the bishop when I was eight years old. Well, then when that bishop retired, my father had to look for a job. Unfortunately, people didn't want to hire my father simply because uh, he adopted this child. Yeah, you know, it always amazes me just because of someone's color of the skin that they want people just walk across the road or whatever. I, I, I mean... I think there's bias in everything, to be honest. But, I mean, I have not experienced what a black man would experience. Obviously, I wouldn't dare to say that. But I think everybody sometimes experiences some form of abuse or some kind of um, not, not nice words to people. And then people will say, oh, it's only words. It don't hurt. But it does deep down, doesn't it? Because at the end of the day, you're a person. You want to be loved. Everybody wants to be loved. I like the beginning of when you put in your you got chapter one welcome. I like the beginning. You got the flames shoot skyward, and claw at the moon. The orange and yellow tongues of the fire dance above the shades of blue. I am still sound asleep in my crib, enjoying the last moments of blessed peace. At eleven months old, I cocooned in a land of dreams and willing to leave. It's the summer of nineteen sixty eight. And those flames are coming from the front yard in my own row street house in Dearborn, Michigan, a small town of Detroit. The sound of voices on the front lawn in the early summer morning, light hours brings mum and dad out the restful sleep. Mum springs out of her bed when she sees a reflection of flames on the ceiling and walls of a second story bedroom. At the window, the only, she only sees a blurry glow of fire below. 
She does not take the time to get her glasses. So her vision is limited to shadows and flickering lights. Her mind recognises it's a fire. It as a fire. But her neighbour million and near sighted eyes can't focus to tell what that what is on fire. I like the bit that you immediately grabbed us by that expression about the fire that you said earlier about, you know, that seeing the flaming cross of that. I mean, he's associated, obviously, with the Ku Klux Klan and quite a few members of uh, society in um, America. Because I know, I, I, I know neo neoism is quite, it used to be quite strong over here. I don't think it's as bad as it was. In Europe, it's very strong. It's very strong over Europe. And I think there's quite a few in America as well. But it's just a shame that people feel that way. As you said, if you could talk to him, you probably could say to him, "Look, you know, I'm no better. Than, I'm no different to you. I'm no better than you. I'm just me." Yeah, exactly. I think you know we've seen this, the the surge of groups like that over the last four years, especially because over here we had a leader that told everybody that was okay, and it's caused a lot of issues in our country um, but I think we're now at a point in America where the issues are so bad that we've got to address them to move forward and I think we're finally at the point where I think real change will happen in a way that I've never seen in my life now obviously you talk a lot about your being a doctor and you obviously volunteer to help other fellow adoptees and I think people don't realise what it's like to be somewhere and you're in a home, say, and you're waiting for someone to turn up just to be someone say, yeah, you can come with live with us. Because people don't get that. They just don't, can't get that, that attitude or that feeling. I don't think they can. Yeah, it's, yeah, the adoptee experience is very unique. And yeah, you're always, you get a lot of messages sent to you that you're not, you're not worth much. Like you say, to just boil it down to the fact that, yeah, you're waiting for someone to come to you and say, yeah, you have value, come live with us. But yeah, and it, I, I just did a podcast last night about the trauma that comes with adoption. And what mo, mo, a lot of people don't understand is that, yeah, that's very traumatizing for a child to not be able to live with their original family waiting and longing for someone to say you're okay. That causes a lot of issues for adopting. Have you ever been in contact with your natural parents, or is that not available? Yeah, I started looking for my biological mother when I was in college, look on and off, and, and actually did that for 20 years, like in 2009. Uh, and it was the first time I was using the internet. I, I searched for my mother, uh, and unfortunately, she had passed away in 2003. Oh, that's so a I never shame. got to meet her. And then interestingly, too, my biological father, he uh, passed away in 2003 as well, within two weeks of my mother. And they didn't know each other after. They just went separate ways after I was born. And I found out later, too, that I don't think my father even knew that I was that I was his and then, yeah, that I was his. Yeah, I think you got to, I think as you say, it probably was a tough decision back then because obviously the pressures were a lot different than they are now. I think people forget like you said, they forget that society has moved on in lots of ways. Not brilliantly, I'm not gonna say they had but like magical progress, but we are a bit better than we were. I think we're a bit more um try to bring more feel into films, acting and dramas and we're trying to create a bit more as hard as it is because as you say it's all down to attitudes. If we we can yeah. change our attitudes just by speaking to someone like you, Kevin, like we know your journey. We can listen to your journey, we can read your book and then people can relate to you a bit more and they can think, Oh my God, that's me. I've done the same thing, you know. Yeah, that was a 
big purpose behind me writing the book was I wanted to, people to be able to understand what it was like to be a child of color growing up in America and what that experience was like. And so the book talks about all these crazy stories of growing up and having fun, which I think most people can relate to about you know, what it was like growing up you know, as a child. And then what I tried to do was then just say, okay, this was the experience. And then this is how I, I interpret it as a person of color. And I've been told that that has allowed people to kind of just understand a different experience, which, which to me is what race and racism really boil down to. Well, it's a tremendous insight, isn't it? You've been there. Uh, you've got the T-shirt. You've read the book. You've got the DVD. You've, yeah, yeah, you've done everything. Now, obviously, do you still do your speak a bit? I know it's not as easy now, obviously, because of COVID. But do you choose to try to still do speaker bits on Zoom or anything like that? Yeah, so, yeah, the, the pandemic has yeah, sent us all home, but, yeah, it's made it easier. Cause, yeah, I've done, I do meetings, trainings uh, all the time on Zoom. Do you enjoy it? Do you think, do you think we should use Zoom as, I look at it this way, if I use Zoom as if you're in that, this room, you're sitting across from me, and I treat that you're here in, the, here in this room, so it, it comes a better conversation, instead of pretending that you're in America, and I'm over here, and then the, the, the conversation will be a bit more stale. So, so it's really hard to be a speaker on Zoom because there's that you can't hear the the response to what you just said, which is really important when you're speaking, because then you can get a feel for whether they're getting it or you have to further explain what you just said. So that makes it really difficult. Um, and it's funny. Usually when I go speak in person, because I'm sharing so much of my own personal experience. When I come home, I'm just emotionally exhausted. But when I do that on Zoom, that doesn't happen because I don't get that emotional connection, which is what I really miss speaking in person. Do you think the children, your children, or the children like your children, are growing up in a better world, per se? I know, as I said before, we did say that there's lots of progress still to be made, but progress does not come overnight, unfortunately. I wish it did, but it doesn't. No, I think... Yeah, I think my kids have had a harder time with race and racism than I have. And there's a couple of reasons why. One, I grew up in a predominantly black city, so I was, I was part of the majority in that city, where now we live in a predominantly white city, differently because that's just unfortunately that's human nature and to pick on the one that's not like them. yeah I, I do, as I say I just think it's a shame that we live like that but I think it's been around for a long long time way before this uh, the pandemic come along it's been I think the pandemic in some way is open up the issues a bit more so we can talk about it a bit more and anything you talk about is no longer taboo in my words right. it I've talked about subjects that I consider quite taboo, but I think if you don't put them out there, nobody can deal with it. Like you just you've got to talk about it because if it's an issue, it will never get sorted until people like me and you. We might have different opinions. We might not agree with each other, but we can have a civilized conversation without reverting to name calling. I'll share, like you said, I have a lot of experience in race and racism. I've studied it quite a bit. And so it gets so frustrating when I say, no, I think that had to do a lot with race. And then people will dismiss my experience and say, no, I, you got that wrong. You're being too sensitive. You're pulling the race card. Yeah, I'm afraid that does happen a lot, doesn't it, unfortunately? Yeah, so I think the trouble is, as good as the media can be about reporting things, it can be so negative at the same time. 
it's a double-edged sword. I mean, we we hear it obviously when it's a crime. Obviously, a coloured person is more likely to get in the paper than a white person. I would I would say that. I'm not going to hide that fact. That is that is a fact that shouldn't be that way. But it, I mean, obviously, we could commit crimes and we could do things to na- nasty just as much as anybody else. You know, we're not, we're not special people. We've not got any special powers. But um. I think you've got a better president now, as you mentioned before. I think Biden will be a bit better to talk to. I think he's more understanding than Trump. Trump was a bit divisive. I I don't know if he's going to get impeached. I don't think so. I think he'll get away with it. But that's our our personal opinion over here. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, the votes aren't there for him to get impeached. But I I, I think it's good for us to go through the process so that people understand there are consequences for doing bad things. No, is there anything else you would... Yes, I agree that I think Biden is, he's more inclusive. He understands the need to have different voices at the table, and that's important. Well, also he's got a first, is, I get this right, African, is it, she's African and West Indian or something like that. I know she's got yeah. mixed race. Yeah. Yeah, which is good because then it, it promotes that the fact it doesn't matter about being mixed race you can, as long as you do your job. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. it's good to have a a, um, a figurehead in the news, as I say. Yeah. yeah. Now, what other projects have you got in mind then, Kevin? What are you trying to progress? Um, so most of the time what I do is I work with organizations, schools, universities uh, in the area of what we call in the state diversity and inclusion. Um, So I work with companies to try and figure out, you know, the biggest challenge we all have is, you know, how do we get the extremes to kind of function in the same space? So if you're, you know, running a school, how do you create an environment where the kid with the Black Lives Matter t-shirt and the kid with the Make America Great Again hat can coexist? So my job is to go into those environments and encourage the schools to have these conversations where it becomes more inclusive. Where we allow kids to express who they are in a respectful way and uh, coexist with them and talk about them. Yes, it's almost like the Star Trek episode from years and years ago. Uh, with um, the one who played the Joker, where he was black faced and white faced one side, and the other side, the one was black faced on the left side and white faced on the right side, and he couldn't stand each other. I think it's quite relevant that episode, even today. I, I've watched it recently and thought, my God, they were talking about racism, but they hid it under aliens. I thought it was a clever episode. People don't. I think they don't realize they were talking about it without yeah. saying the word. Yeah. Now, Kevin, please mention where people can find your book and your. I know you've got two websites, so please mention both of them. Yeah, so I have website, but one website, but you can get to it two different ways. So, uh, if you just go to www Kevin Hoffman, H O F M A N N dot com. You'll get to the website, or you can just go in under the name of the book, which is Growing Up Black and White dot com. You'll find the book. Uh, there's a couple examples of me speaking and training on that website as well. Uh, I sell t shirts that promote the importance of diversity on that site. Well, it's always important. That I think that's important. And obviously, um, what do you do in your spare time? Obviously, you have spare time. You, I mean, we've all got spare time at the moment, so we must be doing something else. Yeah, so, you know, thanks to my mother, Helen, uh, I have a very creative mind, so I like to make things. So I do a lot of work with wood. I'm a woodworker. And, yeah, it's interesting that I didn't spend any time around my biological mother, but I inherited yeah, that desire, that creative mind, which is what she had. 
Right. Um, is there anything else you wish to talk about, Kevin, or mention? It's entirely up to you. No, I think we've covered um, Now, Kevin, I always ask my guests the same uh, question. Kevin, what is your unique sign-off? What's my what? Unique sign-off, like, like end what you would like to end the show with. Here's mine to you, Kevin. I will quote a person called Michael Jackson from a song. It doesn't matter if you're black and white. We should be all together and not fight. I talked to Kevin Hoffman today and found an interesting insight of how it is to be both black and white. And look up his book, Growing Up Black in White. It's out somewhere in the universe today. You'll find it impactful. You'll find it interesting. You may be... Slightly disturbed by the story that's told, but that doesn't matter. Just read it and learn, because without learning, we cannot be, we cannot progress, and we cannot be you, and we cannot be me. And that is good night. <laughs>